Welcome everyone. My name is Jasmine Nauta, Digital Marketing Assistant here at Asian Culture and Media Alliance. I have the pleasure of hosting today's installment of ACMA's ongoing series, BD Activism, a series made to bring awareness to social issues in the Asian American Pacific Islander or AAPI community. For today's discussion, we'll be navigating the space in between, where we'll focus on the Pacific Islander and American identity. As a second generation tomorrow and Filipino American myself, I am particularly excited for our conversation today. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, Asian Culture and Media Alliance is a nonprofit organization based in San Diego. We host various programs, including the Take One Internship, Asian Voices Television Show, and Asian Pacific Community Connection Business Directory. An award-winning program produced by ACMA, Asian Voices is the only cable television show that highlights Asian Pacific Islander community leaders and organizations in Southern California and is currently in production of its fourth season. Take One is a biannual vocational training program for young adults to gain hands-on experience in film and production. Finally, ACMA hosts an online business directory made specifically for Asian and Pacific Islander-owned businesses in Southern California called APCC. If you'd be interested by any chance, go ahead and send us an email at info at acmasocal.org. All right, and that's all from me for now. Let us welcome our event moderators, Deja and Jake. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, again, my name is Deja, and I'll be one of your moderators for tonight. I was a Take One intern uh, last spring. And I'm currently an undergrad at CSU San Marcos, and I'm majoring in sociology with a minor in uh, film production. So as a second generation Samoan and Black American, I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories of others um, in the space in between. So thank you all for joining us today for ACMA's first media activism webinar um, of the year. Within Pacifica, we use Talanoa, the, the practice of conversation and storytelling to build and strengthen community. The conversation will explore the Pacific Island space in between uh, Pacific Island American identity to find out what that means culturally and how it affects our um, communities at large. We all hope that by the end of tonight that we'll be able to collectively amplify voices of the Pacific using the power of storytelling. So thank you for joining us today. And next, moderator Jake Sorlozano. Hello, everyone. My name is Jake, and I will be your second moderator for this event. I'm a marketing intern at ACMA and currently an undergrad at UCSD, majoring in communication and business. As someone who is half Filipino and Ecuadorian, I am also honored to be here as well. Please join me as I will start with the night's agenda. First, we'll spend around five to 10 minutes getting to know our panel. Then we'll take some time to speak to each panelist about their journeys, advice, and experiences. The end of our event will include a Q&A session where all of you will be welcome to share your questions through the q and a box on the bottom of the screen. Please include who you would like to direct these questions towards, and they will be answered near the end of the webinar. Now let's meet our guests. First, we'd like to introduce educator Rania Awalua. She attended University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she majored in Pacific Island Studies. The Pacific continues to play a significant role. In the words of Teresia Teiwa, we sweat and cry salt water, so we know that the ocean is really in our blood. Everyone, please welcome Rania Awilua. Hi, everybody. Hi, P. Good to see you. Um, so my name is Rania. I am Samoan American, was born in American Samoa, but uh, raised here in California. Um, I currently teach part-time at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills, and I teach Pacific culture. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks, P. Uh, can't wait to hear more from you. Uh, next, we have <clears throat> executive director, instructor, and founder of Kainga Music, who will also be joining us later for the Q&A, Kaylee Ross Motley. He received his BA in music at Trinity College and earned his MA in education counseling from San Diego State University. He is currently the Mana Counselor and Coordinator at Miracosta College, as well as their men and women's rugby coach. Coach Kaylee believes that community 
and a sense of belonging is essential. And he continues to create, utilizing his strength of building community wherever he is. So let's take a look at the trailer for the award-winning documentary, In the Panyard. This was also written, this was also produced by Garrett Phelps and Kelly Mall himself. So now I'm going to introduce Dr. Fina Usina Daisa Tovo, who was a Tongan American scholar born and raised in East Palo Alto. Her lineage is from Iunisi Tovo of Nuku Alofa Tonga. Dr. Fee is the MANA Learning Community Coordinator and a professor in Counseling, Success, and Pacific Studies. She also works within the California Community College System where she oversees the MANA network. Dr. Tovo's research and PhD dissertation, Talanoa Amana, has been recognized worldwide by AAPI and American scholars. She is a proud first-generation college graduate where she attended UC Riverside, San Jose State University, and San Francisco State University, where she received her BA, MA, and PhD in education leadership, respectively. As the coordinator of MANA San Mateo, Dr. Fee would like to share a performance by the MANA class of 2018 filled with the spirit of Polynesia.
please welcome Dr. Fee Tovo. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Jake and Deja, for allowing us to share space today, especially with Rania and Kelly um, <clears throat> and Jade tonight. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone. I am currently the Mono Learning Community Coordinator at the College of San Mateo, and I also teach here as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Finally, we have educator and writer, Dr. Jade Hidla. Dr. Hidla holds an MFA in creative writing from CSE Long Beach and a PhD in literature from UC San Diego. She writes about topical issues in Vietnamese arts and culture, as well as her experiences growing up as a second generation mixed race Vietnamese in Southern California. Now let's watch a short clip and hear from Dr. Hidla herself. My name is Jade Hidla. I teach in the letters department here at Miracosta. Uh, important thing to know about me is that I am a first generation college student as well as a first time faculty member in my family. I come from a family of refugees, no books in the house, no reading. It was not expected for me to go to college, let alone become a nerdy English major complete with glasses. Um, so I am very passionate about being the first person in my family to represent this field of study. Uh, accordingly, one of my biggest accomplishments is teaching our first Asian American literature course here on campus, as well as our very first hip hop as literature literature course on campus. I also teach everything from English 100, English 52, uh, which is our highly supportive English class, and English 201 for our critical thinking. And I teach the class for the MANA program, which serves Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students. Um, so these are often underrepresented voices. So we really use this highly supportive English model to help students become empowered in the stories that they have to share, the arguments that they have to make, and how we can use writing as a force for good for the individual, but as well as the communities that have been marginalized here um, in Oceanside in particular. Hey, thank you so much for having me and for forcing me to look at myself on video, which is always a learning experience. <laughs> thank you. Um, but it's really wonderful to be here. Um, even though my heritage is Vietnamese, Irish, Norwegian, and I am the first person in my family to be born in the United States. Um, I do feel very closely connected to the Pacific Islander community because I've been the sole English instructor um, in the MANA program at Miracosta for the past five years. And so that is, it, I always tell my students, you know, family by, by blood is something you can't choose, but family by water is something that you do. And so MANA is definitely part of my family and we laugh and cry and bleed and sweat together. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, definitely. Um, if you guys don't, I used to attend um, Maricosta College back where uh, Jade teaches, but it wasn't the same or it, I didn't feel like you know, free to explore my own story in certain spaces. But every time I entered the space of Mana or like any time I heard uh, Auntie Jade's name or other students call her Auntie Jade, that's how you know, like it was home and we're about to get cracking. So anyways, um, we're very excited to hear from you all. So let's get started with the Q&A. And the first cue we have here is for Rania. So when thinking about PI culture and education, how did you come to nurture or navigate the space between self-education and for you specifically, uh, someone culture? Um, sh should I still explain what that is, Deja? Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, so VA, uh, for those who don't uh, know what VA is, VA is like, a concept or a worldview that a lot of Pacific Islanders share. I actually like Hilda's um, or Jade's quote on her um, introduction because she talks about uh, knowing self and then um, your surrounding, right? And that's what Va is. Va is like a committed relationship and it's reciprocal, yeah? And so like the way our ancestors used it um, back in the islands, it was like, say um, a person and the land, right? They have a committed relationship. So I have a duty to take care of the land, right? I cannot um, exploit it or over extract it because it won't grow when I need to eat, right? It won't grow um, in sync yeah, with myself. 
So I will do it out of love with care. And in return, it will reciprocate and it will kind of um, give me the food I need. Like it will nourish my body. Yeah. So that same concept is used in a lot of Pacific cultures and the way we take care of people, you know. Um, and so the way I saw it with education is like, when the way our ancestors, especially of Kali Hofa, the way he writes, I saw Hofa on one of the attendees. I was like, oh, so we got uh, Kaylee, we got uh, three, you know, relatives and we got some more relatives of Hofa. It's just meant to be, right? The ocean is here. But the way he he always like hypes our ancestry, yeah, our ancestors, and especially the way they looked at the world and the way they looked at knowledge, yeah? Knowledge is not just housed at a university or an institution, right? The way our ancestors saw it, you could um, learn from the water, the smells, uh, the wind, people, um, sounds, right? Um, it's all encompassing. And so when I, um, you know, being at an institution now um, and teaching, having space, like I'm honored to be able to teach Pacific culture and also um, share space with other people who hold space for Pacific culture. I think that's a way to kind of like um, grow that limited um, way of what we see knowledge now, housed in the institution, but see it greater. And I think that's a way of kind of like uh, nourishing knowledge or the way we see knowledge, reframing in that, yeah? Um, so I hope that answers your question, Deja. Thank you so much, Bronia, for sharing that heartfelt answer when we're talking about the space in between, which is actually the very basis for Dr. Fee's dissertation, Talanoa Amana. Therefore, Dr. Fee, what made you take the professional career route that you ended up taking? Can you tell us a little more about your journey in the world of academia? Yeah, I don't think, um, thank you, Jake, for the question. And Rania, you're right, Michelle Haofa, uh, my sister, she's um, part of our participants tonight. She's from Papua New Guinea, and she's tuning in live from there. So I appreciate you, Shell, for being on tonight. <clears throat> um, being able to talk about how I got to my career path, it's something that like you don't wake up one morning and say, oh, I wanna be a teacher. Like we were raised, to be lawyers and nurses, <laughs> police officers, all of these other respected, very public servants, but not as much as teachers as much, you know? I think for me, it was more of like, um, I felt like I was destined to be here. I felt like a lot of uh, my ancestors that when I was combing through my historical like all of my history and my blood, my family, we were definitely educators. Um, we were definitely scholars. Uh, we do come from the same line of Ebele Haofa. And I think when I was in college, one of the biggest reasons why I went into education as a career was that I just was really, I felt like I was, I felt I, I, I had this guilt chip on my shoulder that why was it like 20 of me and my 20 Pacific Islander friends together in college and I was the only one that was able to move forward, you know? And you can't help but acknowledge that. You can't help but say like, you feel like you're the one that left them behind. Um, and I think that that's what like really motivated me to go back and and, and think about what I really wanted to do, what my purpose was, and and just people really believed that I should be in education. Um, and if it wasn't for the allies that I had before me and my mentors, who just really wanted me to be in a space where I could gather people, that's what I was good at. I was really good at trying to make a party or like <laughs> create a party or attend a party. <laughs> and I think, um, just being able to do that really got me through um, into breaking into the academic world. Um, and the way that I broke into to education was through admissions and records. Um, not a lot of people talk about the, the trenches. A lot of us talk about instruction and administration and education, but a lot of us don't talk about admissions and records. And I actually think that that's the reason why I really loved um, education was because I really was getting all the calls from the moms, students, the teachers, just being really confused and me being able to help thinking about what Rania said about this reciprocal relationship. It really does spark more connection for me in education. So I started in staff and now that I'm more into coordination and admin and research and faculty, but 
if it wasn't for admissions and records, uh, I don't think I would have um, had the opportunity of being able to be somewhere where I can make a change. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Deja warned me you'd come in with the heat with, that, with, with these answers. I'm so happy you did. <laughs> oh wow, that was, thank you. Thank you. For oh, you're welcome, Jake. I'm just kidding. Um, I think, you know, it's that that hidden curriculum that you're talking about, Dr. Fee, like one of my aunties like just went back to school and she's like in her late 50s or something. I'm putting her on, on the spot. But she's in her late 50s and like she was telling me like, I need, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, what are they talking about? They want me to, what? Like one, technology is a thing. Two, like, how do you write a formal essay? Like, people don't like learn that like in everyday everyday life so like being able to have this opportunity and learn from others like yourself and to be able to pass it on and teach her like me teaching uh, auntie like I can do that like I did it I was like okay and her being reciprocal to that is that vlog and her being reciprocal to open to me teaching her and her listening I was just like Okay. And it's in that, and it's in that particular experience when you're both doing that, and you guys are showing vulnerability, mm -hmm. and when you show vulnerability in that type of way and love, that's what creates this like harness of love within education, and that's the reason why I stay in education, is because my coworkers and my students and my teachers above me as well they continue to make me feel seen. And I re appreciate you telling your auntie to keep going because it doesn't matter how old we are. Like, she gonna definitely get her degree. I'm so excited for her. Congratulations to her. I know, me too, me too. Thank you, thank you. So, um, so Dr. Hidla or Auntie Jade, your work aims to decolonize our past, to empower our futures through storytelling and crit critically reading self and the world um, around us. So in your book, you describe not belonging here nor nor there. Could you elaborate on your experience dealing with specific struggles of being Vietnamese and having uh, mixed ancestry? Yes, thank you for that question, Deja. I, it's, as a writer, it's always such a, a pleasure and a shock to know that someone has read my book. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I think that we can all agree without a doubt that people of color struggle with this feeling of belonging anywhere from the media to education, that it can be a very alienating space. And I think for many mixed individuals, that struggle is compounded by the fact that we experience racism them from multiple sides and sometimes have been alienated by our own families because of cultural differences or racial phenotypes or you know this lingering notion of an authentic identity. Um, and I know that I continue to struggle with that on a daily basis because identity is always in flux. I'm always having to remake and reassure myself of who I am. But I know that when I was a student in particular, I was experiencing racism from both sides and from the outside too. I was constantly confronted with the fact that if I shared that I was Vietnamese, Irish, and Norwegian, that people would immediately ask, oh, well, was your dad a soldier? Which is to imply that my mom was a prostitute in Vietnam. So there was this overarching story, this narrative, often derived from cinema and the media, that um, would inf try to get people to index me somewhere, um, to try and figure out where they, they could position me and how they would treat me. Um, and so I found myself through my student years, really trying to gravitate toward other communities that would accept me. Um, I was always a hermana in my Mexican neighborhood growing up. I gravitated toward hip hop. And then I was a punk rocker with a pink mohawk in my teenage years. Anything to get people to stop asking, what are you? Where are you from? Like, how did your parents meet? Um, because they're silly questions. Like, do my parents met? Because airplanes exist. Like, that's how they met. <laughs> like, people from other countries can meet. <laughs> so um, I was really trying to find my sense of self. And um, I think that's an ongoing struggle. Um, and 
I, I think that's why I write is to remind myself of who I am and concretize the memories that shape who I am. And I think that is a big way that I empathize with our Mana students, especially those of mixed ancestry, whether it's two islands come together to create this beautiful person or Deja, like yourself, sharing that you're a Samoan, but also Black and really telling students that they don't have to choose. It's not a either or situation, but it's a both and. And that is a way to decolonize ourselves, to take away that false choice and say that you are who you are and you can embrace all those sides. That is definitely something that I struggle with as well, identity and just in general. And I think it's something that we definitely need to talk about in this discussion, which brings me to my next question for Rania. Um, so on the topic of identity and education, um, Rania, I understand you teach Asian Pacific Studies at CSU Dominguez Hills. Is there ever too much or too little of either Asian or Pacific specificalities? Or moreover, how do you maintain the balance between Asian Pacific Studies? I think that's a good question. Um, so I, I I think in a lot of API spaces, um, ever since like college to now, um, I've struggled with like being the token Pacific Islander or just like um, not having enough PI voices, right? Um, and we get too much of that space already. So like to have that, uh, again, um, I'm kind of used to it, but I think um, it's kind of, a good practice for myself. I get envious of people who have like mass mass community, right? Um, Hella Islanders in their spaces. Yeah, Oceanside, Bay Area, I see you guys representing um, and it's so beautiful. Uh, so the challenge for me was to like, being that I'm the only like Pacific Islander faculty member um, at the school and teaching um, the only like Pacific cultural class. Um, I use Pacific like uh, methodology to kind of allow other students to kind of share their story. It's kind of like what uh, Jay does, right? You kind of find that relationship with the student, right? Even if we're not um, of the same community, we we still have um, like struggles that are the same. Uh, we still have like opportunities where we can build, um, we can care for one another. Um, what you're fighting for, dude, my community is going through it too, you know? Um, so I think the balance for me, I can't do much. Uh, like I wish I could do like big old moves like what you guys be doing and like your, your other campuses. But what I can do is just have a, a space in my classroom where my students feel included. Um, and then that they can actually share well with our community, right? And so when an issue comes up and they, they think about their community, they're also thinking of our community as well, yeah? Cool, thank you, Rania. And that's a great place to start because I mentioned earlier at the beginning, like just walking on campus or just hearing like, my peers be like, hey, Auntie Jade, be like, that made me like so much just come off my shoulders. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to like make connections between um, like Auntie Jade mentioned earlier, like both perspectives of, of me being black and someone like I'm not being in that space. I'm not hindered by either anymore. And I'm able to like move through each and you know bridge the gap so that both sides can hopefully warm like welcome my story and learn from it at the at the same time so yeah thank you and so for Dr. Fee aside from academia and focusing on your role as a supporter of the NHPI student community what role do you play when helping PI youth like myself and I mentioned earlier like, how do you help, what role do you play in, like, helping them find their own spot or help them to better navigate their own relation with the space in between? I think that um, <clears throat> before, I think, like, my roles have always changed over the years. You know, I've been at uh, the College of San Mateo for about 10 years this year, and um, I I felt like I've always adapted to what was needed then. Um, and then today it's such a different adaption because people, what we need today is different from what we needed six years ago, seven years ago. And 
I can speak to like right now and recent, and I know that we're definitely wanting to keep this in a time constraint because I could definitely go on forever. Um, the role that I play right now is I really just listen. And that's something that I have, I needed six years <laughs> of experience to tell me that that made me more wiser is to shut my mouth and listen. Because as someone who is of diaspora, like what Jay talked about, neither here or there, we often carry our own experience of traumas and we are always eager to help to where I'm like, no, you do it like this because da 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 blah, 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 blah. And, and then da 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 right? And so it's all these things that I can tell them, but it's like, not be like, if you just actually be quiet and listen, students nowadays are actually going through way different things than what we were going through just six years ago, just four years ago. And right now I feel like I play the role of just listening into the context of what they're talking about. Um, I try to allow them to just give them the space. And there we go again with what Rania was saying about this va of being able to nurture relationships. Actually, it actually tells me to be quiet and let the space be the student's space. Um, and I realized that when, once I was more quiet, I was actually much more helpful because a lot of our students nowadays just need someone to just be there. Um, I like that Jay talked about a lot of belonging and talking about this concept, neither here or there. Um, a lot of it has to do with us just feeling like we don't want to tell anyone our story because we feel like we're burdening everyone with it. And when you sit in a room with someone who's um, a counselor or has a master's or you see that they have all these cool gadgets or lifestyle you tend to feel less than and I and I realized that every time I opened my big mouth I felt like I was telling them what to do what to think how to think and that's not what our students need nowadays we we need more spaces where we're quiet and just there listening so I feel like my role right now is to be a listener and my second role is to be that monstrous advocator in the administration roles, where I'm the one sitting at the table, just getting at anybody that, that um, getting at any teacher who comes at our students, you know, um, incorrectly or disrespectfully, I'm the one that's gouging their eyes out in meetings. <laughs> so those are the two roles that I feel like I play today, the listener to the students and definitely an advocator at our administration table. Thank you so much for that answer. As we continue to navigate identity more in depth, um, I have a question for Dr. Hidla. Um, so when thinking of the hyphenated identity that is both colonized and colonizer, what advice would you give to the youth that are having difficulties embracing both sides of the hyphen? Thank you, Jake. Um, I really want to build off all the wonderful stuff that Fee just shared about being an advocate and an ally in creating a space for students. Um, for instance, right now, the MANA students are in their semester of English 201, which is a critical thinking and literature class. And we start out with these colonial narratives about the Hawaiian Islands and Polynesia, all of the Pacific Islands, so that the students are rooted in what has been said about them, how they've been represented by others. Because I think it's only until you realize where a lot of these current day stereotypes stem from that you have the power to dismantle them and see how Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander authors that are writing are speaking back to those dominant colonial narratives and really decolonizing those stories as a way to represent themselves and empower themselves. Um, and I know that you know, having just one perspective on the colonial and decolonial identity is no fault of our own. I was raised by a single mother in a housing project. And so the story that I was getting about myself was from that Vietnamese refugee, impoverished, as Fee said, traumatized perspective. It was very much tinged and colored by trauma and the tragedies that my family had suffered. So I had that one vantage point and it wasn't until 
And I won't say it wasn't until I went to school because school never taught me anything about my people, but I did learn the skills necessary to go out and find the information about my people and figure out, you know, who had colonized me. And I learned French so I could read the French colonial documents in their original without the translation so that I knew exactly what I was speaking against and fighting against. And I was equipped with both sides of that hyphen to really recreate myself. And so um, I strive for what Fee was talking about of making that mono classroom a space where students can explore both sides, the colonist narratives and the NHPI authors narratives and really find what tethers them to these texts. Where can they find unity and understanding and a sense of belonging and a sense of I see you in that literature? Because I think once you realize that you can read a book and be like, oh, damn, that's me. It is so validating to just feel seen and feel heard. And that combats all of the erasure and the invisibility that has been imposed upon our people, AAPIs as a whole, and that continues today um, with the violence we see against our elders, about the poverty, about coronavirus's impacts on our communities. Um, and a lot of this is swept under the rug as other things take the headlines. That's not to say those things aren't important, but we're here too, and we have a story to tell. And I so I think that's really the power of speaking the story from both sides of the hyphen um, so that people are forced to listen. Um, because like when Fee talks, people listen. So when the rest of us talk, everybody's got to listen too. So um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I definitely think on the PI community, especially myself, like I feel like embracing and unity is something that I need. I need to feel like, it's just the underrepresentation. It's taking a toll. But like, moving on. Unfortunately, um, welcome, Coach. Wait, actually, sorry. One one more thing. I just want to like mention, like I mentioned earlier, like being able to move between both sides, like multiple ethnic backgrounds plus the hyphen, like being able to move in and out. But let me make it clear, like being able to do that, it's not it's not easy and and again that's why you know spaces like mono or and with people like fee jade coach kaylee and rania that with each other that it helps us better like learn about ourselves and be able to move in and out like i'm learning to do but but yeah sorry jake no no yeah that was i wish i could have put that into words but i could have like, <laughs> you're good you're good <laughs> Welcome coach Kaylee. So we have been touching upon concepts of the space in between. And early, earlier we saw your cha trailer to the In the Pan Yard. Um, so coach Kaylee, you studied music in college and from what I saw in the trailer, the space between you and music is very rich in the community. Can you tell us what led to the beginning of your nonprofit organization, Kainga Music and the work the organization does? Yes. Uh... First, I just want to say thank you for uh, providing the space, and I want to apologize for my uh, uh, tardiness. <laughs> um, and, but I'm glad and I'm honored to be here with um, uh, amazing people. Uh, and it, and it's uh, it, uh, and just knowing all all of you, I'm excited <laughs> just being here with all of. You. Um, so yes, so um, so you saw the 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 uh trailer of the documentary um th yes that was in trinidad in tobago in the caribbean uh and the instrument focused is the steel pan also known as steel drum and i was there during my junior year of college in a study abroad pro program in 2004. oh my gosh almost 20 years ago and um when I was there and when I came back, I remember that day, um, my mom picked me up. I went straight to my brother's high school volleyball game. And someone asked me, oh, how was your trip? And I just looked at them and I was just like, you know what? I think I know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm like, what? <laughs> and it was going to, whatever I decided to do in my life, it was going to revolve around the steel pan. Um, 
And I didn't know if I was just going to be a performer or I was going to teach it. So I started teaching uh, group lessons in 2009, had four drums. Uh, currently today, we have over 20 drums and they're expensive. Um, so they're about 15, 1600 per uh, drum. But I, um, what I experienced in Trinidad, performing with a group of 90 people, uh, um, and they call it a pan yard. So in the pan yard is the name of the documentary. But what was the makeup of that pan yard? When I performed, there was a like 11 year old girl right next to me, I was 21. Like four people down, there was an 80 year old man. Uh, I remember vividly one row in front of me, two people to the right. It was a woman that was probably 24, 25, full on pregnant and delivered a baby two days later of one of our performance. And, you know, and, and I just looked around. It was a full community. It was the neighborhood. Um, and I was like, what other, I don't know, activity brings people from different generations together? Um, and you have this community feeling uh, uh, at the rehearsals, but then that performance at the end, it, it's, I've played at many gigs, <laughs> played many, in front of many people, but in Trinidad, that was the most energy I've ever felt uh, in a live performance. Um, so I, so kind of music is to try and replicate what I experienced is, is create an opportunity for um, people to come together through the means of music, through this instrument, uh, and they feel a sense of belonging. And you, you practice together. And um, I use the same oral tradition of teaching. And so you don't have to learn how to read music. Um, and, and it's a very easy instrument to learn, actually. And it's fun in a group setting. Um, and uh, so the, the oral tradition of uh, teaching by rote, you just give them a couple notes at a time, do the rhythm, repeat, repeat. So there's always constant talking. And so if I'm working with another section, it is a natural icebreaker for people to start talking to each other. Oh, so what was that note? I forget. And they're helping each other. And that opens the door for conversation. I guess, Talanoa, right? <laughs> so, and then when, when that happens, you feel connected. And it's pretty awesome to see, you know, people in their 50s talking with teenagers, uh, you know, having a full on conversation, uh, uh, 11 year old with uh, 80 year olds just talking to each other. So currently uh, the youngest student that I have is six years old and the oldest is 81. So I'm pretty proud that, and, and there's people in between. So I'm pretty proud that, um, and it's grown and growing. So, sorry, I'm, I'm getting focused at being, trying to be in this space. <laughs> I'm just rushing from one meeting no, to No, it's great. I was like, there it goes again, me teaching the auntie, the va, and community. You got impact, coach. You got impact. <laughs> but anyways, um, again, one more. I, this is the last uh, individual question. But, uh, coach, I'm curious. Did you go to Trinidad with the intent of creating the documentary? Or how did how did that work? Yeah, so, No. I did have, I had zero intention of making a documentary. I, it was, it was there first semester, January through the end of April or beginning of May. And I brought my camcorder. <laughs> Can you imagine that? This is before the phones, cameras. And I filmed everything because I was just excited of what I was doing for the idea to just say, hey, mom and dad, look what I did. That was it. <laughs> And then uh, my best friend from high school, uh, Garrett Phelps, he was into film. And so he edited a little montage of my time and it was pretty cool. And I took that to um, um, my professor at uh, Trinity College where I went my senior year and I said, hey, just check this out. And then he used it for his world music class, like just, you know, they, for one week, they talked about Trinidad and Tobago and the steel pan. And so he used it and I was like, oh, I, there's, a, there's a little market here. And so I went back to my friend and I said, hey, 
let's redo this. It the first version was just 20 minutes of just footage being edited. No narration, no interviews. So we made it into a 45 minute documentary with narration. Uh, but um, we, I've learned that during this process, the, even in documentaries, you usually write out beforehand, like we're gonna have an interview here, we're gonna interview this person or whatever. So we, dis we decided not to use any footage outside of just what I filmed. And I didn't interview anybody. So there's no interviews in the documentary, but it still tells a, a, a good story, um, how it's edited. And so yeah, it we entered in film festivals and we got into a few and we went to one, it was in Riverside. And I remember uh, one of the directors of another movie at the film festival, when we talked about the process, they were like, you guys are crazy not doing like a storyboard beforehand. <laughs> and so you did it backwards. So uh, I definitely respect the time and talent for any film project, even if it's 20 seconds. There's a lot of, it takes a lot of time. Um, so, so yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> so much for that. Um, these answers were so like, full of experience and love. I love it so much. Um, so now we are gonna move into the Q&A session of the panel and we would love for the audience to interact as well. For the time being, um, we're gonna discuss um, some pre-submitted questions that we think are pretty important. So first question is when discussing the space in between, what complication comes with the everyday venture of negotiating identity. If you could start us off, Dr. Fee, uh, then Dr. Hidla and TJ, and then the rest of the panel can chime in. Asia, could you um, redo the question again? Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. Um, when discussing the space in between, what complication comes with the everyday venture of negotiating identity? <clears throat> Um, well, sometimes the first one, I think I'm just going to tap onto one because I know that the rest of the fam will definitely tap into the rest. Uh, for me, I think it's the, the not really acknowledging both sides, what Jade said before, um, the complication of that. Like, I'm going to just use an example because I think it's really difficult for me to generalize this without saying what I actually want to say. Um, and before I say this, I do want to acknowledge that I am a Christian. I am a daughter of a pastor. My mom is faithful to her church and she's a Methodist pastor. And what I want to, the reason why I bring this up is because it's a, it's a discussion that may not be, we don't have enough time tonight to talk about it, but we, at least this is something that I can utilize as, uh, as a way for me to show you guys what I kind of mean. Growing up as a Christian and as a Fife Gao's daughter, or as a, before she was a pastor, she was our Sunday school principal. <laughs> um, you tend to have these behaviors, attitudes, and assumptions of who you're supposed to be based on the Bible. Not just the Bible, y'all, the Tongan Bible. And that's a different Bible. I mean, it's not the different Bible, but the way that we teach it, yeah. Everyone's all laughing. You already know what's up. And as a diaspora person, the complication of this is when I was first introduced to this concept of indigeneity and indigeneity with religion and the complications of that, right? And so I put it in the context of Christianity and how I believe in this particular path for me and a particular religion practice with rituals that come with traditions. And then in my master's program, I'm introduced to a worldview that is supposed to be me as Oceania, but it doesn't always match and align with my Christianity identity. That's the complication for me that I continue to deal with, right? And I'm not going to like continue to move forward because I think that we all have our assumptions of what it means. But in my research with Linda Tuhiwai Smith and Dr. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, she talks about these things that we do not, we as Tongans, we do not acknowledge this. 
And because of that, it hinders our limitations of what we can actually do as Oceania. And I am not saying that I am acknowledging the complications of being a Christian with Oceania as a way for me to say that I'm a less Christian than you are, or I'm a more Christian than so-and-so is. Um, and I feel like I continue to navigate and negotiate these complications of diaspora because at one, I am American and one, I am Oceania and those two conflict all the time. So I use the same concept in saying the complications of actually being a Tongan Christian and then also trying to be a liberating activist, <laughs> being everything else of Oceania that I feel that I, that I can do once I decolonize. And if we're not acknowledging both areas, we are also allowing one of our areas to overshadow our hearts. And uh, I'm gonna just leave it there. I'm gonna let uh, the rest of my panel continue, but that's where I'm at right now. Would anybody like to chime? No, I'm gonna, okay. So um, we're actually, before we move on, uh, Dr. Fee, it's like, again, like speaking, okay, I'm going to be very like blunt here, but anyways, so at, in, for me, my, personally, from my perspective, like growing up, I would see things like swept under the carpet a lot, and it was brought to my attention that we had to learn that from somewhere, and if the Pacific, if Pacifica is like we're taught about community, 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 then where did we learn to sweep things under the carpet? And which brings like the European ways we were taught that. So like, again, it goes back to like, we're not, we don't learn about what we have to unlearn. Then again, we can't fully do what we're capable of. So thank you for sharing that. And mm -hmm. We have a question here from the audience. Um, so it says, um, what advice do you have for someone who lives in an untraditional manner and how can this person be more Islander if they don't have any organizations or resources at their school? Um, hearing about Rania, her story, I really think this question would like resonate with her. I really, like, I think she can tackle this pretty good, but if anyone else would like to chime in, I'd love to hear it. Do you have any advice? for the anonymous question, Rania? Thanks, Jake. Um, I I like our uh, discussion about like going the binary, right? Colonial and like decolonial, right? And then even this question kind of reminds me of that too. Like um, I would first ask like, what do you see as traditional or how do you define what Islander means? Yeah, I think, um, what I struggle with, just me personally, don't come for me, Kay, my responses, but it's like, at what point do we be, we're, at what point can we um, have the agency to choose in between the binary, right? To kind of claim like, hey, um, actually we made up some stuff on the colonial side or like what gets, I guess, credited, right? Um, as like success or something like that. It's something that's usually uh, not credited to people of color, right? So like, um, where, where do we get to kind of like start to create, you know, create our identities, yeah? So I kind of, I like this question, like, um, and I feel like uh, we could start um, just like kind of defining what Islander values uh, suit you. What um, Islander values do you like? I, I don't feel like there's a standard Islander. I think um, what's beautiful about our culture is that we're so communal. So like, we, I hold some stuff, Kaylee holds some stuff, she holds some stuff, you know? And um, she, I'm sorry, uh, Jade holds some stuff too, right? And so like together we hold a lot, right? Uh, and we're not, I don't think um, we've ever been um, pressured to kind of hold all the answers ourselves. I think that's what's so beautiful is that we're in relationship with each other. Uh, because I'm connected with you, um, you teach me um, things that I missed out on our culture, yeah. So um, I don't know um, if that helps, but I'm sure you know more um, about your culture than, and maybe you just need a space to kind of let it out. Or just, uh, you know, even like um, for me, I, I've always thought I didn't really know Psalm one language, right? Because I grew up in the diaspora. But when I took a class and my teacher uh, forced me to speak Psalm one, I was like, oh shoot, I'm not that bad. I mean, I still suck, 
but not that bad. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, hey, sometimes I think we just need the space to have, you know, to, to kind of get it out um, or to create, right? Um, reclaim for ourselves. So thank you for that question. I just want to jump in real quick if I can. Sorry, Jake. Um, but I love what Rania said so much and it brought so many things to mind. I'll try to put it in a nutshell. And I apologize for dipping out a second ago. There's literally bumpers all over my lawn from a car accident. Everybody's okay. Everybody's walking and talking. So it's okay. But I live in LA. So that's what happens. Um, I think this idea of becoming more Islander or more fill in the blank um, is this notion of authenticity that has been constructed through colonialism, which makes people of color this perpetual foreigner, that especially for APIs, we're seen as this exotic other that comes from far away and people want to know about all of our mysterious ways and traditional ways of being, like we emerged from the mist or something, like we haven't been here for thousands of years with very complex civilizations and stories. So um, I would echo Rania in saying that we can, you know, let go of that idea that there's one way to be an Islander or one way to be any identity, um, that you can go take those language classes or you can download that Duolingo and feel proud of what you didn't know that you knew. Because I think um, with identity of being an in-between space, you often are taught to be anxious about needing to choose. And if you can't choose, then there's all this anxiety surrounding it. I have a lot of anxiety surrounding like cooking Vietnamese food or even speaking the language, even though it's my first language, because I've been judged and told it's not good enough, or you're not truly that because you weren't born there, or because you're too tall, or because you're too light-skinned, or whatever it might be. There's always something that you're too much of. So the fact that it's so subjective, that everyone can see you as too much to belong to any one group, shows that there's not one identity. So if you're trying to please everyone else and live up to someone else's definition, it's going to be so exhausting. And honestly, I get tired sometimes of thinking through and doing all these things to try and balance my culture of trying to learn the things that were lost through the diaspora and through the war, all the documents that were burned, the bodies that were slain, all of these things that my family had to change in order to come here against our will. I am trying to reclaim that and it's tiring. Um, so you have to be prepared for the exhaustion that comes with trying to create or recreate your identity. But no to like what Rania said, everything that you are right now is adding on to what Islander means. The fact that I like comic books and hip hop is adding on to what Vietnamese American means. I don't have to walk around in an ao yai and a, a rice conical hat all the time, bowing and you know giggling behind my hands to you. No, who I am is already Vietnamese. So kind of flip that script and embrace who you are to know that you are already the Islander that you need to be. You can go back and learn things and reclaim things, but you are already an Islander just by virtue of being you. Mm -hmm. I am so happy you chimed in. I was actually going to ask you because I know you've had so many identities that you've had to navigate through. So I'm actually really happy you decided to chime in on that question. Um, due to the lack of time, I have one more question. Um, it's directed towards Coach Kaylee, but anyone feel free to chime in. So in regards to the topic of identity, how do you counter Pacifica erasure? Because my, my first initial answer is uh, I'm just being me, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's how I counter it. I mean, that's, um, you know, um, not, not apologizing for who I am. Um, and I don't know, I, I get, I am a extrovert and I make it known, you know, like, but not everyone is an extrovert. So I think, um, I, I, uh, with that personality, uh, I just learned this like last week of like extroverts versus introverts. Like there's the, the, I, I am a charismatic, I'm out there, you know, people see me. And so it's easy for me to say, I'm just me. Right. However, for introverts, well, how do we celebrate introverts? Right. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, that don't like the spotlight, but how do we celebrate them and stuff? So, um, sorry, I'm going off 
off the topic, but I, I, to answer that question for me, um, I just, I, I, I me with the context of, I, I was blessed with the parents that I had that encouraged me to be me. Um, remember my mom a long time ago to me, my brothers, my dad's a musician. And she was like, you could be anything in life, whatever you want, just don't become a musician. For those married to a musician, you understand. So anyways, my brother and I became musicians, <laughs> but you know, she was supportive, right? And I think that's, that's, you know, I, I, you know, it's easy for me with this extrovert, you know, outgoing person to have the confidence to say, I'm going to be me and that's who I am. But that's in context of I, I was blessed with the opportunity to feel confident to do that. Um, and, and encouraged and supported throughout. So uh, I, it's humbling. And so whenever I do give back to the community, I mean, I think it hit me in seventh grade when I was like, oh, I thought everyone's parents were like my parents. It like, <laughs> you know? And then I honestly was like, wow, that's, I don't know how people can do it. Cause I, I personally think my parents are the best, you know? Um, and I'm lucky to, to have that. So, um, so yeah, I just want to put everything in context. Cause you know, it's, it's easy for me to say, just be you, but the, you know, I had, I had a support system, but for those who might not feel or have had uh, the, the support system or didn't feel, um, I, I, it's, it's looking into first, you know, just if creating, I, I just, I know it came late, but the VOD, the space to create the space to find your voice or, you know, find that person um, if it's not within your family or or something. So um, that's just my uh, suggestion um, because like Fee, I like when I hopped in, she said like she's listening and that's what I'm trying to do <laughs> is I'm learning that is to listen. So to create that space for those to explore. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thanks coach for that. Again, if you didn't catch on the common thread today uh, between the space or yeah, in between the space was community, and it just, I hope this served as a reminder that we need, it's so important that we realize how much one another is um, important to, how much we are important to each other, so just remember that, and don't be afraid to find your own community and lean into one, each, one another and listen, so... With that being said, I'm so sad to see us all go. Jake, you can take us out. So as we conclude this webinar, we would like to thank you all for your attendance and participation in navigating the space in between Pacific Islander heritage. And a big thank you towards our panelists. As we conclude the webinar today, I would just like to thank you all for your attendance and participation in navigating the space in between Events like these would not be possible without their support. We ourselves have grown to become inspiring storytellers through mediums of television, film, and media, and would love for the youth in our audience to be able to grow with us as well. Please consider looking into our Take One Media Vocational Training and Internship Program to learn more. Again, thank you for attending. We would love if the audience could provide feedback to further improve our webinars in the future by scanning this QR code. And that concludes our event. Please give another big round of applause to our passionate panelists. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye.